Hi, this is Robert Sinjatis again. I just had some technical difficulty. Apparently, the program was having a hard time getting itself into newsfeed, whatever that is. Um, but let me reiterate that uh, we are here to take your questions regarding the Bible, the church, tradition, theology, philosophy, anything of that sort that's on your mind that you would like to discuss. I've been on vacation for a week, and I don't know if you can tell, but I got a little tan, and everybody asked me, how does a guy with a tan already get a tan? Well, you're looking at it. So um, I hope it uh, improves my appearance for you. And as you can see, we have the same background, books and whatnot all over the place uh, to give us that studious feeling. So if uh, you're inclined and you would like to discuss things, uh, please feel free to chime in. Um, I did not have a topic prepared tonight. I, I usually don't actually. I just go on what is fed to me from the questions. And, um, but I do have a list of questions that were left over from two weeks ago, believe it or not. Uh, put them on my desk and they were there some miraculously this morning and uh, I was ready to go with them. So I do have like, there must be about four or five questions that were left over. Uh, but those of you who have um, tuned in now, uh, I will not hesitate to get to you. And so we'll start right off the bat. Uh, I just want to make two um, advertisements. And uh, one is regarding a book that I had talked about the last time we were here two weeks ago. And that is uh, a new book I just put out, Why I Left the Catholic Church. As you can see, that's in quotes, uh, refuted by Robertson Jennings. So it's uh, not too thick. Uh, paperback, I think, what, $9.95? I'm not sure what, what it cost, what we put it up there for. Uh, that is available for you. Um, this was occasioned by a friend of mine who was accosted by two Protestants. One, I uh, couldn't tell which denomination it was. The other was from the Church of Christ. And he, he and I have the bulk of the book going back and forth. And um, the other guy, similar, you know, objections that... Uh, are very common and so um, as I was writing this uh, to help this friend out of this problem uh, I said you know what this would be good for the public at large and um, so it's what ended up to be 180 pages or so good reading I try to make it as simple as possible cover all the basic topics you know papacy Mary indulgences purgatory justification, you know, faith or works, um, you know, those baptism, the sacraments, you know, the saints, all that stuff. So um, sometimes I find better ways to explain things than I have, you know, many years ago. So you might get the benefit of that in this new book here. So I just want to make that available to you. Uh, another book uh, I, I want to, uh, to advertise a little bit more. Um, I mean, the sales are, you know, they're, they're piecemeal. <laughs> um, so, but I, I wanted you to have the benefit of this book because this was my original uh, doctoral dissertation when I went to uh, Maryvale Institute back in, what, 2001, 2002. I never did complete that PhD program there for various reasons. I actually went back there uh, again in, I think it was it 2012, 13, to uh, restart that PhD program and ran into some more difficulty there. And um, yeah, I don't want to get into that right now, but um, it eventually saw my departure and uh, I was like two and a half years into the program and had like a year to go and never did get that done. So um, 
at any rate, um, the dissertation that I was working on then relates to this book that I put up a couple years ago. Um, not a very popular topic, I guess, because it's so esoteric. But this, uh, the title here is The Immutable God Who Can Change His Mind, The Impassable God Who Can Show Emotion. And there's a nice picture there, one that I can find that shows the son and the father with you know, expressing their love to each other. Um, but anyway, this book, it's pretty deep, but um, it deals with all the fathers and Aquinas and some modern theologians on this issue of the, even though God is immutable, as we have in our Catholic dogma, can he change his mind? And what does that mean if God changes his mind? Uh, there's all kinds of ramifications to that question, as you can imagine. Uh, because a lot of people associate immutability with the fact that God couldn't change his mind. Well, is that true? Okay, so that original dissertation of mine goes into that uh, question. And then on the other side of that coin is God is impassable. That is, he cannot be harmed, hurt, uh, uh, you know, lessened in any way. Um, but does that mean he can't show emotion? Now, the reason we would ask that question is because the modern idea of emotion, uh, even from Aristotle and Aquinas, uh, was that uh, emotion is just the, as Aquinas said, the blood curling around the heart. So to him, it was just physiological. There was no ontological component to emotion. And uh, I thought, I think that's a detriment to our Catholic theology, especially in light of all the saints who have these very emotional experiences with God, and God in turn uh, capitulates to them in some manner. Um, not that that is the definition of it, but um, I think it's important for us to know that when the scriptures speak of God being joyful or angry or compassionate or whatever, that these are real descriptions of God and that they in no wise uh, transgress on either his impassibility or his immutability. We hold those as dogma, but uh, we misunderstand emotion a lot because, um, you know, who's a great fan of this book is women. <laughs> uh, they just love this book because, you know, finally somebody is Lifting, you know, they always get, uh, uh, you know, criticized for being too emotional. But uh, they were, they're happy to see that someone uplifts emotion higher than Aquinas did, higher than the idea that it's just blood curdling around the heart, uh, to an ontological state. Okay. And um, my dissertation goes into that very great detail, as you can imagine, uh, as my other books do on other topics like justification or scripture or whatever. I do just the same with this. So um, it comes in paperback or hardback. Um, I suggest you get the hardback. It's, you know, it's always nice to handle a hardback. I mean, you know, once you throw out the dollars for it, but it's well worth it in my opinion. And, um, uh, you know, will I deal with that topic? And uh, I, I guarantee you, by the time you come to the end of the book, you're going to be thinking very differently about this topic when you before you went into it, as many people have told me. So uh, take a look at it if you get a chance. Um, it sticks as, you know, orthodox, it sticks as uh, close to the orthodox position as possible, but also shows that there is room to... Uh, look at these things in a slightly different light than we have may have been before and because of that we're able to come to a very good balance a lot of the fathers support it as a matter of fact the fathers were very divided on this issue uh, and Aquinas also shows some you know equivocation on it as well uh, and you know that, that's when you go deep into his writings the Summa and and you find out that it's not all hunky-dory with Aquinas. There are some problems that he never really uh, found solutions to. 
And um, so you'll see that in there if, if you want to go deep into Aquinas' uh, beliefs on this. All right, enough of that. I've been describing it too long. I think I've taken up too much time. So let me put that down. And we will go to the questions. Let me see what we have here first. All right, uh, Ben says, greetings, Robert. Please keep, your ex keep up your excellent work. What accounts for the different races among human beings? Ultimately, all humans trace back to Adam and Eve. You could even say that all humans trace back to Noah's three sons and their respective, oh, this is a long one, and to their respective wives. I heard from a Catholic a theory that of Noah's sons, Shem gave rise to the olive-skinned, red-skinned, and yellow-skinned peoples. Ham gave rise to black and brown-skinned peoples. Japheth gave rise to white-skinned people. What are your thoughts on this? I would assume that the three sons of Noah and their wives were all of the same race. How did the different races come about then? What was the race of Adam and Eve, as well as the racial identity of Noah and his wife? In a similar vein, does the Catholic Church allow the marriage of a Catholic man and a Catholic woman who are of different races, interracial marriage, assuming that there are no impediments and each is free to marry? Thank you for your insights on these matters that you can provide. I appreciate all your efforts. Uh, wow, uh, it's all order there, Ben. <laughs> You've been saving it up for the last two weeks, huh? Okay, so let me see what I can deal with first. All right, so let's just look at Adam and Eve. Now, we know from genetics that we have a very complex molecular structure, structure in our cells called DNA, dexyribose nucleic acid, okay? And then there's the, the messenger uh, DNA called RNA, ribonucleic uh, acid, which helps communicate uh, between the DNA uh, in, the, in the cell. Uh, and then there's many other things that they're discovering. I mean, it's just a complicated mess, not, not a mess, but to us it's a mess. To God, it's perfect. But <clears throat> it's, a, it's a mechanism. I mean, they say if you look at a cell and you count all the things that are going on in a cell, just one cell, skin cell, heart cell, brain cell, whatever cell it is, these things are microscopic, and yet they say there's enough going on there that it's similar to a city, you know, with, with electricity, water, waste, heat, light, uh, you name it. All of that has to be taken care of. The energy levels, uh, storage, uh, you know, it's just mind-boggling what has to go on in a little tiny, tiny cell. And you have trillions of those in your body. So as David said, we are fearfully and wonderfully made. Um, that's one thing. So in this DNA, um, God has made room for many, many variations. Okay? And as these potential variations meet various stimuli in the environment, then they are going to change the organism so that it can adapt to those changes, those environmental changes. So let's say this organism, well, let's call it a human. He goes to, uh, he, he is used to cold weather and then he goes to hot weather. And that would have occurred uh, after the flood as we went through last time, okay? So, uh, what's going to happen is the potential DNA adjustments that were already built into him when Adam and Eve were created are going to be stimulated and they will uh, adapt accordingly. Okay? So um, those who live in hot regions where there's a lot of sun, they're going to need a lot of melanin in their skin to rise to the surface to protect that skin, as you can imagine. Uh, so this is how the black races would have originated because the change to dark skin would have already been a 
accommodated in their DNA structure, you see. So it's just a matter of when that DNA is going to turn on, so to speak. You know, like we, we say computers uh, run by uh, ones and zeros, ones and zeros, you know, sequences of that. And basically what that means is a computer is a machine that turns itself on and off, on and off, on and off, you know, billions of times a second <laughs> to, to perform functions. That's how they found was the easiest way to mechanize something, all right? And your DNA is very similar to that. And maybe that's where they got the idea. Because it wasn't too long after they discovered that the DNA can turn itself on or turn itself off that um, they started making computers that way, okay? So who was the first one to use the digital schema? It was God himself, okay? By turning on or off uh, the DNA sequence where it was needed to be turned on or turned off, all right? So that's how it would happen. Now, whether it's dark skin or curly hair or, you know, being tall or short or, uh, you know, whatever the variations are among the races, this is how it's going to take place. And as you know, after the flood, there was very great, very, excuse me, there was great variation in our climate, much more so than there was before. And... Um, uh, this would even cause some of the animals to to die out, like the dinosaurs, for example. Okay, we have we have uh, models and not models. We have um, specimens from clay and uh, limestone and, and different where we see dinosaur tracks with human tracks. I have a a friend of mine who is a uh, world class uh, paleontologist. And he does excavations like this at least once a year. Uh, not only he does also carbon-14 dating on these, and uh, but he has his own specimens of dinosaur tracks with human tracks. And so where do the dinosaurs go? Well, they died out because of the climate change, okay? So here, here's one for your climate changers. Tell them to go back and read the story of Noah. There's where it all began. Uh, but all those things would take place, and... Uh, as, I, as I said, it's going to turn on or off the DNA, and it's going to make uh, different characteristics of human beings, okay? So, you know, look at myself. Uh, I, I've been dark-complected all my life. That's because I'm 100% Italian. And, and where did my ancestors come from? Well, they came from the Mediterranean Sea, okay? And actually, my, mine came from the Adriatic Sea, uh, right in the middle of Italy. Uh, but it was always hot there, okay? And so for generations, they were, they were there uh, doing the same thing, and, and their bodies adjusted. Uh, and we, we have stories in, you know, the creation versus evolution debates of, you know, the spotted moth in England, uh, how it changed its wings just in a short span of time to accommodate what was happening. Uh, so, we, you know, we get a lot of this uh, in, in nature, uh, but the reason is because God built it that way, okay? God built it for variation, and the variations are going, and there might be many more variations we haven't even seen yet. And the DNA molecule is so complex um, that uh, there may be even more uh, kinds of people we haven't seen, you know? And they discovered this as they were discovering nations in Africa and islands in the South Pacific, you know, people that look slightly different than the other islands, you know, like Tonga or Polynesia. They look slightly different, and yet they were similar, but the reason was because of their climate and their DNA adjusted to it, you see. So that would be the answer to that question. Let me see what else you got here. Um, uh, what was the race of Adam and Eve? Well, that would have been the original race, whatever that was. The unmodified DNA, you might want to say, okay? The original unmodified DNA that lived in this tiny little place near the Euphrates River um, that was in a pristine environment, okay? So whatever kind of um, race that would produce is the kind of race you would have. I have the slightest idea what it was, 
okay? All I can tell you about is uh, what they call a posteriori argument. That is, why do we see different races now? Well, that's because there was an adjustment from an original race, okay, whatever that was. We don't even know what language Adam and Eve spoke, and it wasn't Hebrew, okay? That didn't come along until the time of Moses. So uh, they must have passed down some language, okay? But we don't know what that was. So there's a lot about them that we don't know. Um, let me see what else we have. Um, Catholic churches allow marriage of a man. Yeah, they, they allow it. Um, you know, that's, but that's not the whole story. You know, I just went through this with my own daughter. who's <laughs> asking me these questions. And, you know, there's, uh, you know, what like the Bible says, what is allowable is not always expedient. Okay, so it's not just a legal matter. Uh, you know, if, if, if it was just a legal matter, you know, our lives would be uh, very different than, than they are normally. Um, you know, the speed limit is 55 miles an hour in some places, okay? Do you know anybody that goes 55 miles an hour? I don't. Um, and even if they tried to go 55 miles an hour, they're, they can try it as hard as they want to be as legal as they can be, but they're never going to be able to satisfy it because they're going to go up and down uh, 55 miles an hour, whether they like it or not. All right. Uh, I mean, that, that might be a crude analogy. And uh, but the idea here is, you know, just because something is legal doesn't mean it's the best thing for you to do. Okay. Any parent knows that about raising a child, uh, you know, is it okay if I go do this? Well, yeah, legally it's okay, but not the best thing you want to do right now, okay? And you can give your reasons for it. And so we have an intuition. We have common sense. We have wisdom. We have uh, experience. All these things have to come into play when we're talking about whether it's good to do something or not. And that if I do it, um, is it the best thing I, sh I could have done? And am I ready to suffer the ramifications of that decision? Okay, this is another important area uh, regarding interracial marriage. Um, you know, perchance you happen to fall in love with somebody of a different race. Nobody's stopping you from getting married, but there are ramifications to that, whether you like it or not. And the society the way it is, um, although as we progress, we're becoming a little bit more open about these things. Still, you know, uh, the children that you're going to have, they're, they're not going to be black or white. They're going to be something in between what we call a mulatto. And um, there's nothing wrong with that. But do you want your child to face, um, you know, uh, the potential of criticism that they're going to face when they go to school or they play games or whatever, you know, sometimes they won't, but there is a potential there of that. And you have, you have to deal with this the rest of your life. Okay. Whether you, you know, you like it or not, you know, one parent's one race, another parent's another race. And the third, the children, they're really of another race, so to speak. Okay. So you got three races you know, that's a, that's a, a brew for, you know, some kind of difficulty coming down the pike, okay? So that's what I'm saying. You got to be practical about this. And, you know, it's not like, you know, if you have a white woman, uh, there's not like there's, there's no white men that she can marry that would lessen this kind of difficulty, Okay, not to say they're not going to have difficulties. They will, whether they're white, both white, both black. Uh, they're going to have difficulties. But, you know, in life, life's hard enough. You don't want to make it any harder on yourself than necessary. And so the question, the practical question, not the legal question, the practical is, is this the best thing for you to do? Okay, now if you're so head, and head over heels in love with someone, okay, nothing's going to stop you. You know, you're ready to take the repercussions, whatever they are, all right? And, you know, God bless you. 
Um, but, you know, th these are things that you have to think about. All right? I think I, I covered that. Uh, okay. Let's go on. See if we have any more tonight. I have a lot of people who joined. Saul, Jose, Francisco, Alex, Donald. Says, hi, Robert. Hi, Donald. We are Syngenocentric. Wow. That's a new one. <laughs> uh, don't say that in public, Donald, okay? Thank you. <laughs> uh, Mitchell. Uh, okay, let me see if I can get this name right. Jabernson, I think I've got it. Kate is here. Robert, you are back. Hope you had a great vacation. I did. Uh, went down to Ocean City, New Jersey. I, mean, I don't know if you've ever been there or not. Voted the best family vacation spot in America, in case you're interested. Um, been down there. I've been going down there since I was a kid. My parents used to take me down there, and I take my kids down there now, and I'm sure they're going to take their kids down there. All right. So Bob has joined. Gage has joined. Uh, Alfredo has joined. Hello, Mr. Syngenis. We'd like to see you debating again, especially the Jehovah's Witnesses. I just debated a few of those in my house here about, I don't know, six months ago. And uh, here's another trick they use. Okay, so, you know, I'm getting all ready. I'm going to get these Jehovah's Witnesses, you know, and sit them down in the chairs in my kitchen. And uh, uh, two, two women, very young, and I figured, well, this is going to be a cinch. Um, so we're talking and, um, and, and, and we must have talked for, uh, at least an hour, if not over. And I was getting them on every point, man. I was just nailing them. Okay. They'd bring up something. Well, what about this? And what about that? And I, I'd answer the question and I said stuff they'd never even heard of before, of course. Okay, so I'm thinking, you know, they're, they're going to get down on their knees and they're going to say, I repent of ever being a Jehovah's Witness. Please help me. Bring me to the Savior. You know, I'm expecting this kind of uh, result at the end of the discussion, right? And so, um, I, as a matter of fact, I raised, if I remember correctly, I raised the point. I said, well, you know, you know, we've been sitting here talking, and, and I was very genteel about this, you know, and not getting excited, just giving the information. And I said, you know, we've been talking about this now for an hour, and gosh, it just seems to me that on every point, uh, you weren't able to answer, uh, you know, forthrightly from the scriptures, uh, because, you know, I would offer you a counter scripture, and, and you would go, hmm, hmm, hmm. And, and all that stuff. And I just figured, you know, she's just accumulating all this information and, and she's just suddenly going to pop and say, I give up, I give up. Lo and behold, after an hour of discussion, she goes, well, uh, you've given me a lot to think about and, and I'll make sure that I think about it. And the, and the other girl didn't say anything. She was just sitting there. And, and I said, oh, okay, that's fine. And I said, but are, what are you going to do in the meantime? She goes, well, uh, I'm just going to continue to read. Um, oh, oh, they were, I'm sorry. They weren't even Jehovah's Witnesses. They were Mormons. Same difference, though. I mean, really. <laughs> and she goes, I'm just going to continue to read the Book of Mormon and see if I can find the answers. <laughs> so you can see... Um, you know, all that huffing and puffing that I did to not blow her house down. She had this, and, and I found out later that this is what they do now. If you get them in a corner theologically and you trap them, uh, they will come out with, well, thank you so much for giving me all that information. You've given me a lot to think about. And maybe when I see you next time, and there, there will be no next time, because after they leave, they mark your house. <laughs> so that no other future Mormons will go there to, to put up with someone like me, okay? Uh, you know, and so they've got all the bases covered, 
there's just no way to penetrate them. I mean, you could win every single argument and uh, think that you've got it made and at the end. They're just going to bow the knee and well, thank you very much. You've given me much to think about. <laughs> so out they went. Um, so that's what's the, that, that is what debating Mormons is like or Jehovah's Witnesses. They have honed their craft, to say the least. Okay, um, so yeah, sometimes it's just not worth it. Now, I'm not saying that I wouldn't debate a Jehovah's Witnesses, because debate is the key word there. And when I say when I think of debate, I'm thinking of um, a public oral debate with a moderator and an audience. And the reason that's important is because when I debate, I don't debate for the sake of my opponent. I'm going to use him, okay? Yeah, I don't use human beings at all, but when it comes to debating, I will use them. And I will use them to the hilt because the witnesses are the audience. They know who's winning and who's losing and who's playing games and who's trying to get out of something that they've got themselves into by giving excuses, okay? They're smart people. So that's why I would debate either a Mormon or a Jehovah's Witness uh, because of the people that are there watching it, okay? So um, with that, I'll keep it in mind. If anybody wants to offer me a Jehovah's Witness to debate, uh, send me their information and, you know, see, see what happens. I get a lot of people who, who, who say they want to debate, who almost come to the table, but for some reason, uh, I can't get them there anymore. I mean, we used to have a lot of debates, like in the, what, early, late 90s? I think I started debating, what, 90, well, actually early 90s, but just a few. And then late 90s, it picked up. And then early 2000s, it picked up uh, so that I had, what, 30 debates, 35, around there. I counted them a little while ago, around 30. Um, I didn't realize I had so many, but we had a flurry of them because I had run across someone who was working to to uh, produce the debates he wanted to me to debate all kinds of people and he footed the bill i just basically showed up at the debate and um he was he wasn't responsible most of the james white's debates he wasn't involved with but all the other debates i had he was involved with um but like after 2005, six, I couldn't find anybody to debate. And they would, you know, give an initial yes and then pull out or give it some excuse or not even answer the phone anymore. The only exception was Matt Slick. Um, we didn't manage to get him, but he actually pulled out of a debate, um, the, the third one we were supposed to have, and then tried to blame it on me. Um, but any, at any rate, let me go on. Um, so you believe in climate change then? <laughs> Keith. Yeah, I'm a big believer in climate change, Keith. I tell you, how can you disagree with 97% of the world's scientists who tell you that the climate is changing? How can you? Somebody posed that to me the other day, and I just said, you know, I've been studying science and scientists, mostly scientists. There's a big gap between science and scientists. But scientists, like any other art, science, or endeavor of mankind, most follow the crowd. So it doesn't surprise me at all that 97% of them believe that the climate has changed or is changing. <laughs> Whatever minuscule degree they think the temperature is changing, 
that, you know, it doesn't matter. The fact is in their mind, something's changing. You know, we, we got to fix it. Uh, but 97% of them. Yeah, I think that's a fact. But then you go in and you examine who these 97% are. And these are guys that work for somebody else. And that somebody else had word from on high that we're now going to believe in climate change because they need something else to stir up the people, okay? So the word comes from the billionaires on high that all these science institutions are now going to believe in climate change, whether they like it or not, whether the science is there or not. You find a way to support it is basically what they're told, okay? And they do their bidding, okay? Otherwise, all those sheepskins they have on their wall they will mean nothing because they'll be out on the street without a job and nobody's going to hire them because they, they're going to be asked, uh, why did you get fired? Well, it's because uh, I don't believe in climate change and I have the evidence to prove it. Do you? That's great. Well, sorry, you can't get hired here, okay, because we have the same boss you do. <laughs> it's okay. Yeah, those billionaires up up a pie, you know, who funnel all the money to, to them to do their projects. Um, yeah, you better keep stepping in line. Otherwise, there goes all your funding. All right. So they're just as politically minded as they are politicians are. They go where the money goes. And, and that's just the way life is run. So it doesn't surprise me that 97% of them believe in climate change. Okay, uh, Gage says, can you talk a little bit about what Catholics mean when they say justification increases when we do good works? I think the increase in justification is what gets lost in the Protestant Catholic debates about salvation. Yeah, uh, that's a good question, Gage. Um, both sides uh, need a little bit of work, I would say. Whether that would come to some kind of amalgamation about justification, I doubt it, because that's not the, the big issue, increasing in justification. Um, but the Catholics have a much more generic, organic way of looking at justification than Protestants do. For Protestants, justification is strictly a legal event. Okay, remember we were talking about legal versus practical before with you know interracial marriage. Well, here's a case where the term justification in Protestantism is just legal. And what they mean by that is it's like you were brought to a court of law, you were convicted of a crime, you're about to be sentenced, and for some reason, the judge has mercy on you, but maintains that some kind of price, a high price, has to be paid for your crime. And if you can't do it, somebody else will have to do it. See, now that's a, that's a warped sense of justice. Because if someone else is paying for my crime, that means the law has become greater than the person. The law has to be justified, and like it's a living entity or something. Okay, so that's what's wrong with that whole concept. And of course, the Protestants believe, and this is always a good question to ask ourselves as Catholics, and that is, what is it that Christ did on the cross to provide for my salvation? So this question goes deeper, and I'm going to get to your exact question about what does the increase in justification mean, but let me... Let me flesh this out a little bit and go right to the foundation so that when I explain increase in justification, it'll be a lot easier to understand. 
So whether you're Catholic or Protestant, excuse me, let's ask this fair question. What is it that Christ does that provides salvation for me? Okay. Now, the Pro just to give you an example, the Protestants believe that Christ pays for the sins of his people. So much so that Luther and Calvin, Martin Luther, John Calvin, back in the 1500s, believe that Christ, in his ordeal, from Gethsemane through the cross, through his burial, suffered the equivalent of an eternity in hell. Okay? He suffered an exact punishment for the exact amount of elect that God elected from the foundation of the world. No more, no less. Whatever that punishment was for all those elect, Christ went through that eternal like hell in his suffering to pay for their sins. Okay? If that's true, wow. If that's true, that Catholicism is all wet. Okay? Because we don't believe that at all. But yet, when you ask the average Catholic, well, what is it that Jesus did on the cross to atone for my sins? They have sort of the same concept that the Protestants do. Well, Jesus paid for my sins. No, he didn't. Not as a Catholic. He would never say that. If you were a Lutheran or a Calvinist or the average Protestant, he would say that. Christ paid for my sins on the cross. No. Okay. Because an eternity in hell is an eternity in hell. Okay. Well, they say, well, Jesus was infinite, so he could suffer an eternity in hell. No. <laughs> not the way Scripture puts it, not the way the tradition teaches us, not the way the church teaches us. Okay. It may sound logical, but it's not. All right. Christ suffered in eternity, he'd still be there. And we, we would be without a Savior, because he would, could never rise from the dead, let alone all the other problems you're going to have with that theory. Okay? So Christ did not pay for our sins. Don't ever, if you're teaching someone, teaching your children, for example, you know, what is it that Jesus did for us on the cross? Don't tell them he paid for our sins. Okay? That will get you all into, when they get older, that's going to get you into all kinds of troubles that you're going to have to try to explain your way out of, all right? So what is it, as a Catholic, do we believe that Christ did for us? What we believe as Catholics, and this is not my own idea, okay? This is from the Fathers, from Thomas Aquinas, from the major theologians that we have. And I was amazed that when I came back to the Catholic Church, when I wrote my book, Not By Bread Alone, in 2001, to find all this information that I had never seen before. Because no one had ever challenged me. What is it that Christ did for you on the cross that, that saves you? And why is it that he had to die on the cross? What's the big deal? Why couldn't God just, you know, forgive everybody? Why does it have to be a death, bloody death? What is it that God gets out of this, in other words? Okay? So I did, I did a dissertation worth work on this when I wrote my book, Not By Bread Alone. And I found some amazing information that the church has always known. And that is, first of all, God's a very personal being. Personal. Okay? I'm personal. You're personal. What does that mean? 
we feel, we love, we have compassion, we pity. All those things that make us a human being, we call them personal characteristics, as opposed to, you know, the stuff you see in my library here. They're just books. They have no personality whatsoever. I could talk to that book up there all night long. It would never answer me. Okay? It has no feelings, no intellect, no will, no nothing. All right? So these are personal characteristics. And that, the Bible tells us and tradition tells us, is what God is. God is personal. That's why we can be made as we are in his image, okay? That's why we're personal, because he's personal. He's personal first, all right? So as a personal being, are you offended when someone insults you? You better believe it. We may try to hold it in, pretend that we're not hurt. Some of us are good at that, some of us aren't. But inside, we're hurt. Why? Because we're personal beings. You can't help but be hurt. Okay? And, you know, men are more capable of holding in their emotions than women. But believe me, women, yeah, we have those emotions. We may hide them, but they're in there. And you say the right word to us, and they'll come blubbering out, <laughs> okay? Um, but we're personal, and so is God is personal. So when we're insulted, we're offended. How dare you? How dare you insult me? Who do you think you are? In front of all these people, you know, doing your dastardly deeds and saying your malicious words and all that, okay? God's the same way. Yes. You ever listen to that, uh, the uh, Fatima prayer? It says that we cease offending God with our sins with which we have already offended him. That word offended, I think, is used about half a dozen times in that prayer. Yeah, well, that, that's a, a very interesting prayer. Offended. You offended God. What does that mean? You offended God. It can mean a lot of things. It can mean some abstract things. It can mean some very emotional things. But when you offend somebody, you insulted them. You've hurt them. You've tried to set them back. You've humiliated them. You have transgressed on their honor. Many, many ways you can describe it, okay? But that's what sin does to God. Can you, let's, let's put it in practical terms. Can you imagine what God felt like, if we can use that term, felt like? And this is, goes back to the book I was telling you about, okay? Can we say that God felt something, okay? For example, when Adam and Eve sinned, what did God feel like? Well, if we can use those terms, and I think we can, as long as we use them properly, we felt, God felt, highly insulted that Adam and Eve would side with the devil in one brief instant. They didn't even check this guy out. They sided with the devil because he said they could become just like God. And they took it, hook, line, and sinker. Yeah, well, that's a great idea. You know, who wants to be in this human form? And God's greater than us, and he's holding something back from us. We could become gods, and he's not even allowing us to do that. Well, God was going to allow them to do that. It just is going to take some time. See, and that's always the problem, isn't it? 
God takes so darn long to do things. Yeah, that's what always leads to sin, because we just aren't patient enough to wait for God. Okay? That's usually the problem. But at any rate, God was highly insulted, highly offended, and they besmirched his honor as God. To follow after this little tramp of a snake who's promising you all these things, and you have no guarantee that they're going to come, and you fall for this measly little character that you meet one time and gives you a load of bull. And here I am your creator. I gave you all these things. I loved you like I've never loved anything else. I coddled you. I, I did everything possible. And you turn your back on me within a second. Wow. Man, did you perspire to my heart. As God, I am the supreme being. There is nothing greater than me. And you trounced on me like I was a piece of dirt. Worse than that. Okay? So now you're getting the picture of who this God is. Okay? When I say personal God, that's the kind of God I'm talking about. That's the kind of God Scripture tells us about. This is no pansy. This is no milk toast um, uh, kind of being. This is not a rock who has no feeling. This is not just uh, an ivory tower. This is not just an abstract idea. This is a, a being with feeling more intense than you could ever imagine. Okay? And this is the way the fathers write and Thomas Aquinas and the medievals write about what man did to God. They insulted him. They besmirched his honor. All those kinds of terms that we apply only to personal beings. Okay? That's what we did. And so, if that's the case, what's it going to take to restore us? At least give us a fighting chance to get back to this God who loved us so much after we basically ripped him apart from one end to the other and totally disparaged his honor. How are we ever going to get back to him? Well, God had a plan. And that plan was to send his son to have him die a humble death, shed his blood, on this cross so that God could be appeased, so that his anger, his wrath would be dissipated. Because every time he looked at that son die on that cross, the anger that he had toward us for what we did to him in the Garden of Eden would be dissipated in a second. He couldn't help it by looking at his son. That's how Christ atoned for our sins. That's what the Catholic Church teaches. Christ didn't pay for our sins. Okay? He did what was necessary to appease the Father's wrath, and only he could do it. Because you needed a sinless person to try to appease A little interruption there. Um, a, a, only a sinless being, namely your own son, is going to be able to even approach you. Okay? And then you have to go through the sacrifice. And even Jesus, in the Garden of Gethsemane, was wondering if there was any other way, Father. Is there any other way that we I can appease your wrath besides this? And God said, no. This is it. This is the only thing that will do. But it will last for eternity. 
and you will save so many people. You see, what Christ did was he preserved the honor of his Father. He took away the insult that we gave to him. He restored the quality of the Father's relationship. He made it something worthwhile. All those things Christ did for us. Okay, So that's very different than the Protestant approach, which says when Christ died to pay for our sins. Okay. And so naturally, if you have that kind of theology, the Protestant theology, you're going to say, well, okay, so he paid a legal price for their sins. That means that since the legal price was paid, there can be no retraction of it. And therefore, once saved, always saved. You see how it all fits together? Okay? So Christ pays for your sins. There can be no double payment. In other words, if he pays for them, then God can't take you up to heaven and say, well, you know, that price wasn't exactly paid for. You're going to have to do it yourself. No, because that would be double jeopardy. Okay? If the sins are paid for, they're paid for. And so you should skirt right to heaven with no stops along the way. And that's exactly what the Calvinists believed. You see, that they were predestined without their free will from eternity because God had already included that particular person, John Smith, in the punishment that Christ was going to pay for him on the cross. And therefore, John can skirt right to heaven when he dies because that price has already been paid. Okay? So that's why the Calvinists talk about, you know, I'm predestined, I'm elected. And therefore, I have nothing to worry about. And that's why you hear all this talk about once saved, always saved. Okay? Of course, we know that's all wrong. Now, the other Protestants, the Arminians and the, the Wesleyans, they have it all wrong, too, because they go to the other extreme. Okay? And they don't have a, a great concept of salvation, either. They still think that Christ paid for their sins, although they don't follow it to its logical conclusion, like the Calvinists and the Lutherans do. Okay? They just don't want to go that far because they're scared to go that far. Because once you go in the Calvinist route, then what happens? Well, then you start to make God the author of sin. Then you start saying that God programmed Adam and Eve to sin. Or if you don't say it, you'll say, well, um, they had a free will, but we really don't know how to define free will. Uh, because God has already programmed that it's going to happen this way. So what kind of a free will could Adam have? That's exactly correct. That's what the problem is, don't you see? Okay? So, you know, they're going to be trapped either way. Well, this is what you need to know as Catholics. You have